Um, I have been praying, actually, for years. Um, but we're, we're, we've come to a critical point at Jesus Community Church. And, I, and I, I'm not declaring this critical point. I believe I'm just acknowledging a point that is here. Okay? So, um, I, I'm going to ask a couple of people that I've, I've uh, talked with earlier in this week or, or over the last couple of weeks uh, to stand up and share with you some of the things that I believe, I am convinced, God is, is laying before us. Okay? Uh, before I do that, I just want to kind of share with you a little bit and then, and then I'm going to have them talk and then I'm going to follow up and just share with you some of the things. But when Christy and I first felt like God was really moving on us uh, to assume the leadership of this body. Um, there were a number of things that we wrote down that we felt like God was calling this body to. Um, that, that was my list. I think it's a good list. But I'm willing to accept that I might be wrong on some of those things. Some of them, I can't be wrong because they come right out of here. And if this body is going to thrive and grow, it's got to be based out of here. Okay? Some of the things are what I see as being specific to this body as compared to other bodies where we would have other needs. Okay? But I, I want to uh, ask uh, if Chris, Christy and, and Jeannie would just kind of share um, they, they each have had a drink that I believe is significant to this body. Now, those of you that go, oh, I'm not into that all oh, mumbo jumbo wooju juice. <laughs> You're in the wrong family. Because we serve a supernatural God. Supernatural meaning that he's above natural. He's beyond natural. We, we serve a God that just by his very existence throws everything that we accept in our reality off. Okay? Not only that, he's told us in his word that he will speak to us through dreams and visions. Okay? So I've asked them to stand up and, and if they would just share what, what they dreamed. And then I, I would like to follow up with that in, in a minute. So uh, whichever would prefer to go first, it's, it's up to you guys. Um. The significant part of mine was actually at the end, but Glenn was up in the front, and the church body was all here like we normally are, and I was standing, my viewpoint was from up in the front. And as Glenn was speaking, I could look out, and there was a handful of people, I didn't know specifically which ones, but a number of people in our body that were holding shields, and they were full-length body shields. They went from the top of the head to the floor, and they came all the way around to the sides. And on each of those shields, the person had a very perfectly painted picture of themselves smiling. And it's like they were hiding behind this picture of, I'm okay. And every time if someone would come up to them from the side, they would turn and put the shield in front of them so they would see that. And then when someone else would come up, they would turn and put the shield to them as if there was something that they were hiding behind, making sure that nobody saw what was really going on inside. And then Glenn said, if we can't be transparent with each other, and then that's where it ended. That's pretty much it. <coughs> Okay, well, I'm not like a dreamer of dreams, okay, because this freaked me out when she said this the other night, because um, I was waiting to see if it had anything to do with mine. I'm not sure it does, but, and I rarely remember dreams. <laughs> and I've only had a dream one other time about this congregation. But this one had to do with a door in the church, and me trying to get through men. <laughs> It was all men standing at the back of the church. And I said, can I get through, excuse me, can I get through? And nobody heard me or they were ignoring, I don't know. So I, can I get through again? Because I was looking for Dennis and they parted a little bit so I could get through. And I looked over the side and I could see my husband shifting papers. He's a good paper shuffler. <coughs> but that was my dream was that men <laughs> at the back of the church, no women, men. I believe that God speaks to his people. 
I believe God speaks to his people in dreams. I believe more often what we eat before we go to bed speaks to us in our dreams. <laughs> okay. I dream a lot. I will have two, three, four dreams in a night. And if I feel like it's significant, I wake up, or if it troubles me, I'll wake up and I'll, I'll talk about it with Christian and we'll pray about it. But I find it striking that in the space of a week, God revealed to two of the elder women in our church, the leadership women in our church, something about this body. Now, you know, as far as the transparency thing in Christie's dream about the shield, um, I, I think that's reasonably self-explanatory. We guard ourselves. We protect ourselves. Um, life has taught us to be very cautious about being transparent, about being open. Don't let anybody see the flaws because that's a sign of weakness and it's an area of sensitivity that they can take advantage of. Okay? I, I think that's reasonably self-explanatory. I think further on that dream, we cannot afford this in the body of Christ. We can't afford it. Um, we protect each other. If you're so busy protecting yourself, you can do nothing to minister to any other person in this body. You're ineffective. You're a tool that can't be used. And ultimately, we're all tools that God desires to use to further his purposes to his glory. Okay? Um, so I'm going to lay that before you. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, Jeannie's dream, I think, deals specifically to the men. Uh, men, there is a call that God has placed in his word and through his spirit that he has asked you to step up and to step out. He has placed in man the position, the accountability, the responsibility of leadership. Okay? It's very clear in his word. He wants you to step up. Now, I don't know specifically what this means, men. Uh, I don't know if, if Jeannie's dream, uh, when she and I were talking about it, she shared with me, I don't know if they were trying to determine what to do so that something could be done, or if they were unsure to come in or unsure to go out. I, I, I'm not going to try and explain that. Because I think, quite honestly, it might be different from man to man to man to man. But I think it's significant, and I think you need to know. Men, God has called you to be more than you are. Quite honestly, if all you're giving the church is what you've got, you're doing the same thing the world is doing. And that's pathetic. Because you have God's Spirit living inside you, capable of taking you to places far beyond you can even think or imagine. Think in this room right here. We could have the equivalent of a Charles Spurgeon, or a John Wesley, or a John Calvin, or an Apostle Paul. in this room. Why not? Because our culture tells us otherwise? Because we have to worry about other things? I'm not discounting work. God established work. You realize God established work as soon as he created man? The two go together. God created him to be the husband, the caretaker of, of things. That's, that's work. God desired that. God instilled that in men. But he also wants us to step beyond that. Okay? He wants us to move beyond what we were before him. And men, um, you know, I said this a while back when we were talking about the, the leadership class that I was doing, the elders and the deacons. Paul writes that if anyone desires to be an overseer, he desires a worthy thing. Not because, you know, we're politically oriented and it's some kind of mad power grab. How do we look at leadership in this church? The leaders in the church should always be the best servants. Okay? They should be the ones that serve the best. The foot washers. The table waiters. Okay? That's how we view leadership in this church. Um, we do those things that enable the church to function and, and not have to worry about how dirty their feet are. Okay? Um, what 
God is speaking to you specifically as a result of this, I, I don't know. I have an idea on some of you because I feel like God has spoken to me about some of you. God wants better than what you're giving him. He wants bigger. Um, you know, a, a while back I gave you the example. I brought a bowl up on the stage <clears throat> up here and a glass. And I said, the glass was your life and the water is God's spirit and, and everything that he gives you that you need. And you can do a number of things with it. I mean, you can fill that glass up and stop. And that's all you get. But the world around you remains dry. You're doing nothing to bless those around you. You can take the water that's in you and you can pour it out to the world around you. And they receive the blessing, they receive the, the spirit, they receive what you have, but then your cup is dry. I really believe, my, my earnest belief, is that cup sets still and that as we allow God to pour into our life, it will fill us up and overflow out of us. And therefore, we will be able to bless the world around us and we will always be full. Remember the scripture says, a full measure, pressed together, shaken up, and overflowing. Okay, that's, that's what I believe God wants for us. Now, here we come to the core of what I want to say to you. Um, Acts chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, flip there real quick. I'm going to start off with the story, and, and you guys are going to kind of look at me like, what? <clears throat> Let me explain the story in a minute, okay? Acts chapter 5, verse 1. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds, and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled up your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds from the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed with your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young man, the young men, rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all those who heard these things. Now, we don't hear many messages on Ananias and Sapphira. I think in my life I've heard one. I've heard him referenced a couple of times, but I've only heard one message about Ananias and Sapphira. And I'm not going to go into Ananias and Sapphira and tell you guys you need to be tithing more or giving more or anything like that. That's, that's not what I want to point out in this. What I want to point out in this is their sin wasn't what they gave or what they kept. It, it was theirs to do with as they wanted. Okay. Peter makes that very clear. <clears throat> Their sin was that they were trying to present themselves in one way when in actuality they were another. Okay. Here's what, yeah, this is all I've got. I'm giving it to you. No, it's not because you've got a nice hefty bank account over there. And I believe that's how God is speaking to His church. See, when you come into the body of Christ, whether it be here or at the Baptist church or, or the, the community church or wherever, when you come into the body of Christ, if you are saying one thing and in actuality you are another, there's a problem. Okay. Um, if you come into the body of Christ saying, yeah, I have a relationship with God, I have made a, a profession of faith, 
I have made my confession of sin. I have repented. And I have accepted a new life in Christ. He is my Lord and my Savior. That's a lot to say. That's, that's, that's a huge amount to say. And thank God so many of us can say that. Right? I mean, where would we be if we couldn't say that? We'd be back under the law, and quite honestly, since I don't know if anybody here is Jewish, most of us would be Gentiles cast off and, and just our only hope is snippy snippy. Okay? But Hebrews makes it very clear. There is a new covenant that in every way supersedes the old covenant. As, as Jesus, the Son of God, is the mediator of the new covenant, he far supersedes the mediator of the old covenant. This covenant is better in every way. Thank God for that. Okay? Thank God for the freedom that we have to come to him in salvation. But, but, uh, click with me if you would to Matthew chapter 5. Um, this is all part of the, the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain. This is a, the, one of the greatest treatises, the lengthiest messages that we have of the Lord Jesus speaking to people. Okay. Um, I'm going to start up here in, in verse 15. Um, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes, bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Okay. Keep that in mind as we continue forward. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, I want to point out a couple of things. Okay? We are really, really bad at judging the quality of a tree by the fruit that it bears. Okay? Because quite honestly, um, there are a number of cults out there that require their people to bear better fruit than most of us have. Okay? They bear better fruit, but they're not engrafted into the vine. And we go, oh look, there's a lot of fruit there. And really what we're, we're seeing is actually <coughs> thistles, not figs, and thorns, not grapes. Okay? But one of the things that I want to point out to you, look at these things that they did. First they say, Lord, Lord, they're acknowledging Him. Yeah, we recognize your Lord. <coughs> Okay. They're not calling him Savior, Savior. They're calling him Lord, Lord. They acknowledge his position, his right to rule. Did we not prophesy in your name? Cast out demons in your name. And do many mighty works in your name name. See, this leads us to a real problem in the church. Because these are the very measure by which a lot of people judge a person's salvation. 
Oh, look at all they do in the body of Christ. Look at that. Well, of course, they acknowledge him as Lord. But man, did you see how many demons he took out with just a few words? Ooh! Or he's given a word from the Lord. Or he's done mighty works. See, as far as they can see, they're okay. But he says to them, I never knew you. But he doesn't just say, I don't know you. He carries it on and he says, depart from me, go away from me. And he doesn't even stop there. He calls them what in reality they are. You workers of lawlessness. You workers of iniquity. You sinners. Now, I'm going to back up just a little bit more because there's one thing I want to show a little bit earlier here. Um, Verse 13, it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to light, and those who find it are few. See, this, this is one of those passages that keeps me awake. This is one of those passages that I pray often over. It's one of those passages I don't like. Because what that tells me is that there are people in our fellowship who right now, if they stood before God, He would say, depart from me. I don't know you. And, I, and honestly, that terrifies me. Because I look around and I want to see all of you there. At the great wedding feast, I want to see each and every one of you there. And I'll tell you, I want it sometimes for selfish reasons, because I want to stand before him and say, God, I did a good job. Look, I brought them all. But right now, some of you are not going to heaven. And I know this to be the case. I don't know. I, I, I can't, I honestly, I can't look at you and say, you are in, you're out, you're in, you're out. I can't, I, that's not what I'm doing. Because I honestly, I don't know. I don't know the intent of heart. I don't know the, the intimacies that's got all along. Okay? And I don't uh, ascribe, I don't supersede God in any way. But if, if His word is true, then that means there are people here who think they're okay and aren't. Because they've said, Lord, Lord, look at what I've done. And he says, I, I don't know. You, you've never come to me. You've never had relationship with me. See, salvation is the introduction between you and the sovereign creator of everything. That's the introduction. That's the hello. Being a Christian is the lifelong relationship that you have with him. Intimacy. Frequency. A desire to want to be with him. One of the things that convinced me personally that I was saved, okay, this, this is personal to me. I lived in fear of death. I was afraid of death. I did not want to die. I didn't much want to live either. I was stuck for years and years and years. I was stuck. Because I, I knew that if I were to die, he, I would be one of those. He would say, I, I don't know you. And my life was miserable because of it. I hope if you don't know him, your life is miserable. 
I hope that, that you're aware that He is driving you towards Him. But that's one of the first indications that I had of my salvation, my eternity with Him, that He was holding me in His hand, was that fear was gone. Not to say I have a death wish, but I, I, I look forward to the day when I can lay all of this down and I can go spend eternity. Not that. You know, that's why, you know, when my dad passed away, I felt better for him. Because I know he got to lay down all the burdens of this life. All the hurt, the sickness, the hardship, all the negative things of this life. He got to lay them down and embrace everything that God has in eternity. See, if you are unsure of your salvation, you go, oh yeah, I grew up in the church. Shelly shared her testimony last week, and, and she has a testimony like a lot of us. We grew up in the church. We grew up in the church. And, and she was, um, well, I think it was about the time Dustin was born when she realized, a little bit before Dustin was born, she realized, I'm not saved. I don't know. God, I don't have that kind of relationship with him. She knew all the words. She knew the lingo. She had the, the shield intact around her. But she was lost. And so I want to lay before you today. But God says now is the day of salvation. There is no, no guarantee that any one of us gets tomorrow. There's no guarantee any one of us gets the next minute. I love that song that we were singing. It just lays out the gospel. He came, he lived, he died for me. He spent three days. He was resurrected in glory. But see, his, his job isn't done. We like to think of as done. We like to think that he's gone up to heaven and now he's feasting and relaxing. But that's not the case because he says that he is our intercessor. He goes up and he pleads our case before the Father. He's, he's doing more work now than he was doing then because there's a lot of us that have cases to be pled out before the Father. Look, I, I challenge you. Take a critical look at your life. I don't care about the different scenarios, uh, how, how you made a profession of faith. I, I'm not talking about that. Okay? I want you to look at your life and know that you are saved. Know that you have given up the rights to your life and taken on a new master, a new Lord, a Savior, that church is not one of those cultural things that you do because it's expected of good people. Okay? Uh, don't get me wrong. I, I am adamant in my belief that God has called Christians together to fellowship. Okay, the church. And I am adamant in my belief that if you are not in church, you are weakening yourself. You know? How does the lion work? It separates them out and then it mauls them. All right? And if you are willing to get separated out from the body, you're going to get mauled. I, I'm convinced of that. But let, let's flip that coin over for a minute. Just because you're here doesn't mean you're saved. I, I think it means that you're responding to God's Spirit, drawing you, calling you, pulling you. But it's not enough to come to the cross. We have to pass through the cross unto salvation. Mark even tells us that we take up our cross daily. Okay? Daily. What do those dreams mean? I'm, I'm not an interpreter of dreams. 
I'm, I, I'm not Joseph. I'm not Daniel. But I know enough to pay attention when God speaks not only through one person, but he speaks through two, specifically in dealing with this body. Okay? My ears perk up. I go, oh, okay. Especially if you would understand the burden and I that the burden that Christy and I have had this week for this body. <coughs> and the, the many times that we've prayed for this body. Uh, I, I believe, I don't know to what extent, but I believe that there has been spiritual warfare going on this entire week concerning this body. And I think it has to do with your souls. Because there are people here whose souls the devil wants. He wants to keep them as far away from God as he can. And if he can convince you that you're okay, that where you are right now, you're okay, he has you. He has you. God's Spirit convicts us of sin convicts us of unrighteousness, calls us to repentance, calls us to lay aside those things that separate us from God. Okay? He's our teacher. He's our counselor. But ultimately, you have to listen and you have to respond. Okay? You have to listen and you have to respond. Men, I think God has laid the challenge at your feet. He's thrown the glove at your feet, if you will. Okay? I believe God is asking the men of this church to step up beyond what you've been given. And, and I tell you, don't get me wrong, I think the men in this church are absolutely fantastic. Um, we have so many men in this church that, man, if you have a need, they are there. And in a wide array of areas, okay. Uh, I'm not talking about just coming and fixing your roof or splitting your wood. The men have always responded graciously in this church. So don't take this as a condemnation. Take this as an encouragement and exhortation <coughs> that God is asking you to go beyond, to step further than what you were doing before, okay. Um, when when Jeannie shared that. that you know, there were men just milling around at the back door. That was one of the things that I had written down that I just, I really believe God wanted in this church. Was that he wanted the men to be dynamic for him. Dynamic. Not, not just okay. Not, not fantastic seat warmers. Okay. God, God isn't looking for fans. He's looking for followers. He doesn't want somebody that's willing to sit in the stands and applaud all the work that's going on. He wants people to get down on the field and participate, get their hands dirty. Okay? Like I said, I don't know what capacity God is calling each of you to that. I, I don't know. Uh, for some of you, God may be telling you, hey, you need to get involved with the, the wood pantry. For others, God may be calling you, you know what? I'm calling you to be a deacon or an elder in this body. I, I don't know. I have suspicions about some of you because God has laid you on my heart. I pray for you often. But women, that doesn't let you off the hook. Because I think Christie's dream speaks to all of us about that transparency. Uh, I'm going to, uh, in a few weeks, I've asked Josh if he would give his testimony. Okay, But I'm going to share just a little bit because his, his testimony was similar to mine. You know, because Josh has been in church his whole life. And the first thing, the first place he had to come to was a realization that he wasn't saved. Okay? Now, that right there you would think would be the hardest part. But the second thing he had to do, and this really took a lot of guts, was he had to go to someone and talk to him. And sure, he had to be transparent. He had to say, I'm not. And I need to be. And I know that. That's transparency. I am asking.
asking you. I'm pleading with you. Today is the day of salvation. Okay? Today. You have an opportunity today like you'll rarely get in your life. And today you will give an account. At some point you will give an account for this day. Before God. Because he's going to have you stand before him. And he's going to say, look, I made it very clear to you on this day. Okay? And when I stand before him and, and he asks me, he says, I made it very clear to you this day. He's going to be asking me that through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And, and I will have that as my safeguard in eternity. I plead with you to examine your salvation, what you think you have. Make sure it's real. Make sure it's real. You know, if you're, if you're having questions about it, I'm not saying if you have questions that you're not saved. I, I still have questions sometimes. Why do I do that? That was dumb. That was selfish. That was sin. But if you have this ongoing, nagging suspicion, it might be God's Spirit speaking to you, calling you, trying to make, break through that nice shield that we have created around us to protect ourselves. Okay? Come talk to us. Okay, look, we have a godly leadership in this church. Okay, God has appointed men and their wives to godly positions in this church. And there are other people that are in this church that are just as godly, that God has not appointed to those positions. But if you have any question whatsoever, please don't walk away from today in that. You can talk to Steve or Angie, Dennis or Jean, Christy or I, Matthew, there are others in here. And quite honestly, if God speaks someone to you, that, hey, go talk to them. Go talk to them. There is absolutely nothing special about me that I have any greater access than anyone else that is saved. Okay? You don't get like a gold star if it's the pastor that leads you to the Lord. That, that's irrelevant. Okay? So... I ask you, we're going to take some time and we're going to pray. And I'm even, I'm even going to, we're just going to be quiet before the Lord for a bit. Take the time. Examine your heart. Examine your life. You know? Examine your life. Because if there is the same before and after, and it hasn't really changed, other than the superficial things. I, I go to church. I have a Bible, and most of the time I know where it is. I pray, oh God, don't let me hit that car. If that is the significance of your spiritual life, the superficial things, and I would, I would question, I would ask you to question the relationship, the dynamic that you have with God. Okay? So let's pray.